Locked away in many a millennial's memory is a faint recollection of seeing an anime dub on Saturday morning starring a talking white cat. Perhaps that hidden memory is paired with a catchy theme song and voice actors recognized from Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. Well today, we are going to talk about this dub and a few other releases of this cute cat and his cuddly comrades, Tama and Friends. But what many viewers may not know is Tama and his pals have been around long before the early 2000s. Tama and Friends was the brainchild of Sony Creative Products Inc., inspired by a missing cat poster asking a simple question. Have you seen my Tama? Yeah, this is not a Sanrio property, despite the visual similarities. Tama and his four-legged friends made their debut in 1983 on merchandise like stationery and accessories, then entered animation with the seven-episode OVA series on VHS from 1988 to 1990. The OVA series went on the air in 1993 under the title Tama of the Third District, Have You Seen My Tama, and evolved into a full-fledged TV anime, giving Tama 29 more episodes of screen time. The Tama and Friends anime stars the titular cat Tama and his many cat and dog pals going on adventures in town, sometimes with elements of suspense and action, but all around having light-hearted, family-friendly fun. Except for one episode that involves World War II, but that's THE exception. Episodes are usually split into two vignettes with individual stories, although in rare cases they are connected. Tama and Friends had more anime series following this, having a fantasy-based one in 2006, and then returning to the kitty's roots in a 2016 short anime series. Then it had... whatever this is in 2020. This Sony Cats had success in The Land of the Rising Sun, but why is he a faded memory to North American viewers? What led to Tama's seeming failure in America, and could it have been prevented? Let's look at Tama and Friends' English material and find out more about this famous feline. Tama and Friends Making Its Trip Abroad was announced on January 24, 2000 at the National Association of Television Programming Executives by Al Khan, then CEO of New York-based company 4Kids Entertainment. Khan announced the anime Tama of the 3rd District, Have You Seen My Tama, using the main series name of Tama and Friends, alongside South Korean cartoon Cubix and what 4Kids described as an edgy teen show named The Adventures of Flamehead, the latter of which never came to be. Tama and Friends is blurred by 4Kids noted the series' legacy in Japan had already spanned nearly two decades and was going to see an international release as a quote, lovable girls and young boys property, unquote. At the point of this announcement, they were only in the planning process of these properties, with no release yet scheduled. Tama and Friends was put in another press release on January 17, 2001, where 4Kids listed it with Ultraman Tika and Kinikuman, the Ultimate Muscle, which would later be renamed Ultimate Muscle, the Kinikuman Legacy. For context of the era, in 1998, 4Kids Entertainment and Nintendo of America took the gamble of a lifetime on a little series called Pokemon. Alcon already had one feather in his cap, making Cabbage Patch Kids toys a nationwide hit, and sought to launch another sensation with Pokemon after seeing how popular it is in Japan. 4Kids was tasked with licensing and merchandising the series in America, as well as dubbing and localizing the animated series, but Pokemon was not guaranteed to be a success for 4Kids or NOA. From NOA's marketing team being uncertain the Game Boy RPGs would click with American kids, to networks not being interested to air the anime, to the unfortunate Pokemon shock incident that made headlines the year prior, to countless other reasons, Pokemon was a gamble. A gamble that paid off in spades. Come 2000, Pokemania had swept the globe and was at its apex. With critically acclaimed video games, a trading card game, a hit TV show, two massively successful movies, and countless toys and other merchandise, Game Freak's monster collecting craze was practically printing money. With all this praise and success, four kids enter the New York Stock Exchange in 2000, a good chance for them to expand their repertoire of licenses. Tom and Friends was among those first projects outside Pokemon. Four kids struck gold with a mouse. Could they strike gold again with a cat? While Ultraman Tiga and Ultimate Muscle from the 2001 press release would need to wait a year before release, Tama and Friends was set to premiere on North American TVs in the autumn of 2001, then begin releasing the show internationally starting in the autumn of 2002. What's more, 4Kids also announced Tama would have a multi-million dollar ad campaign and merchandise to promote the property to Americans unfamiliar with these Japanese cats and dogs. Tom and Friends was later given an official air date announcement of September 15, 2001, although Canada began airing the program on September 7th. It turned out to be an unfortunate time to debut a TV show given what happened between those dates, but tragic world events didn't stop Tama and his cheery face from appearing on North American TVs. 
This cast show was picked up by mostly WB, Fox, and UPN affiliate stations in the US and exclusively on Treehouse in Canada. Thelma found himself in early Saturday morning time slots, usually 7 a.m. local time. The English dub was recorded and produced at Taj Productions in New York, a studio four kids frequented until forming its own in-house studio in 2003. So what's the dub like? What changed the transition from Japanese to English? Anyone familiar with 4Kids dubs will recognize a lot of their standard changes, some of which are to appeal to an international market, others being 4Kids' own decisions. 4Kids replaced almost all the character names. As much as people give 4Kids a hard time for changing names, these can happen for a variety of reasons, from making the names sound more appealing to Americans to making it easier to trademark, or the name already being trademarked. 4Kids was not out to make a show for anime fans, they were out to make a show for the international market, specifically kids. Hence, you know, the company name. The Talma and Friends animals have many common Japanese pet names, but in English the names are more unique. Titular cat Tama and his love interest Momo were the only names kept as is for the English version of Tama and Friends. Sleepy Kitty Bay received the name Chopin, likely named after the famous pianist. The stray cat of the gang Nora was renamed Rockney. The group's bravest feline Tora was provided the new moniker of Tiggle, which makes sense as Tora means tiger in Japanese and Tiggle is a play on tiger. The new name also bears resemblance to the character name of Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. Last of the cats, the youngest, most innocent member of the crew, Koma, was given the name Pimmy. Moving on to the dogs, the fearful Pochi was given the catcher named Doozle. Kind of sounds like a Pokemon. Gon, the dog often seen napping on his favorite chair, was renamed Bengbu after the city in China. Why? I don't know. Kuro? No, not that Kuro. The one I'm talking about is a character by Sony. No, not that Kuro either. The Sony Kuro I'm talking about is a dog. Sorry. Kuro? The dog in Tama and Friends and no other Kuro is named Wakit in this dub. Kuro simply means black in Japanese, and Wakit is a funny, silly name, and you know what? I like it. Maybe it's because it reminds me of that one Dr. Seuss book. And last on our list of animals is the spoiled bully bulldog, Bull. Yes, that is his name in Japanese. A bit too on the squish nose for a bulldog character. Likely because that's not catchy, marketable, or trademarkable, Bull was renamed Bupkiss, which indeed sounds like a more cartoony, dim-witted bully name. Beyond the four-legged characters, the two-legged characters received new names too. Tama's owner Takeshi Okamoto became Casey. Interestingly, Casey was the initial name for Ash Ketchum in the English dub of the Pokemon anime. Whether that's a coincidence or not is unknown, as it might just be based on Ta Keishi sounding kind of like Casey. Momo's owner Amy Hanasaki is for sure a case of names sounding alike as she became Amy. Even in Japanese, the names Amy and Amy sound similar. Another hallmark of 4Kids is dubs, the original Tama and Friends soundtrack was replaced. The new music was composed by Manny Corallo, who also worked on a lot of the Pokemon anime dubs music over its run, as well as Sonic X and Kirby Right Back Atcha. The company replaced music in their dubs mainly to bring in those sweet residuals if another foreign language dub used 4Kids' version as a base. Dub exclusive soundtracks also fill in silent moments. Japanese animation is quieter than American animation on average, and common discussion in the anime community says dub soundtracks fill in the silence to keep kids' attention. Whether or not this is true for this dub, Tama and Friends does keep in some silence. Also, the opening is a bop and is how I even remember the show at all. Interestingly, there is another version of the opening out there. Given it doesn't look like it's from a VHS recording and looks more like a compressed online video file, it's likely this is an earlier version of the opening that went unused on TV and ended up on a website, possibly this one. Another trait of edited anime dub's treatment of silence is to add dialogue. Almost every vignette has its beginning and ending narrated by Casey in the dub, usually accompanied by puns or rhymes. In Japanese, Takashi rarely narrates these segments, and when he does, he's not fully aware of what the four-legged cast gets up to. But this raises questions about whether Casey is aware of Tama and his friends' adventures in the dub. The animals can only understand each other. To humans, they are just meowing or barking, and this includes Casey. So, are Tama's stories happening in Casey's imagination? I'm overthinking this and need to apply the Mystery Science Theater 3000 mantra of it's just a show, I should really just relax. Anyway, there are other moments where no characters are on screen and originally are silent, but the 4Kids dub adds dialogue to fill in the silence. 
To, again, make this show more accessible to foreign countries, Four Kids' editors painted over almost all the Japanese text. Buildings are usually the ones to receive massive paint edits. Papers usually just have lines drawn on them replacing the Japanese text. Perfect for foreign language doves to which Four Kids might have sold these masters. The main exception is the missing posters in this vignette. I can only imagine the papers would be a massive pain in the tail to paint over since the paper moves in the animation. Speaking of Japanese, 4Kids has infamously removed or renamed Japanese cultural elements in their dubs, such as renaming onigiri into other foods. This rebranding of Japanese culture happens in Talma and Friends as well. The common Japanese snack taiyaki, which is a sweet bean-filled pastry shaped like a fish, was said to be cookies, and a dish of fish and rice was said to simply be leftovers. In another episode, Children's Day, a holiday during Golden Week often celebrated with flying koi streamers on flagpoles, became the yearly sea festival in the dub. Remember, 4Kids' target audience was international audiences, especially kids, not anime fans that want something true to the source material. Cut footage is far and few between. Tama doesn't have much in the way of objectionable content by FCC standards, but when it does show up, it's things like Doozle taking a whiz, things that don't happen all that often. 4Kids also added these admittedly uncanny bumpers in between vignettes. Ugh, it just seems... unsettling. While 4Kids didn't cut much footage, they did rearrange the vignette order. A lot. Like completely mismatching vignettes and putting them in random order. This doesn't affect the actual content much, but I found it worth pointing out. Now, let's discuss the script. As noted, Tama is not much for questionable content. Not much need to write around major story beats or anything, as Tama's self-contained plots required barely any reworking. There is a scene in one episode that has a stereotypical drunk salary man on the street after work. He goes home, his wife yells at him for coming home late drunk, etc. Anyway, point is, in the dub, the supposedly sober salary man says that he overslept on the bench and missed dinner. Easy enough, I suppose. One of the only things written around is Bupkis's owner. Let's just say this bulldog's punishments for misbehaving are a bit harsher than no dinner in the Japanese version. A bit more physical, shall we say. Four kids added extra jokes in the dialogue too, both by named characters and extras. You know, Doozle, for a dog, you sure are a scaredy cat. How do I let you talk me into these things? Because I'm cute. Yeah, I haven't been this rejected since my high school prom. Bruh. Overall though, the script feels like it keeps the feel of Tama and Friends while adding in some four kids -isms. Given the era, the lovable cast of Tama and Friends is voiced by classic New York voice actors known for other four kids projects like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! as well as other New York dubs like The Slayers. Kicking us off here, Tama is played by Broadway superstar Andrew Rannells. It's surprising the amount of people that don't know once upon a time Rannells did voice acting for four kids back in the 2000s prior to becoming a name to know on stage. Don't believe me? Watch the other roles list in the bottom right corner. Ready? Now listed are a few of the characters he played during his days taking jobs at 4Kids. Here's how he sounded in Tama and Friends. Oh hiya! My name is Tama. I live in a fun place not too far from you. What makes it fun is that all my friends live here too. Momo is voiced by Carrie Williams, who the following year would play Tiff and Curvy right back at ya. I really don't think there's much to note about this performance. It's fine and works well for the show. Oh well, that's okay. What really matters is that no one was hurt. <gasps> I can always get a new bow, but I can't replace great friends like you. Chopin is performed by Lisa Ortiz, an actress that still works in anime dubbing to this day. Ortiz has this naturally cutesy voice that works wonders not just for this role, but just about every other role on Tama and Friends, and she has plenty throughout the program's episodes. Tama, there's more to it than that. You don't just become a spy. It takes years of hard work, training, and learning secret paw shakes to get into the CIA. Pimmy and Doozle are both played by the now-retired voice acting icon Casey Rogers. Rogers makes these characters sound distinct, plus it helps Pimmy doesn't talk a lot, but she's a good fit by default for a cute show like this. You know, something's starting to tell me I shouldn't have gotten out of bed today. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong, I was just playing. There's nothing wrong with playing, is there, Rodney? Another actor with multiple recurring animal roles in this dub is James Carter Cathcart, aka Jimmy Zoppy, who lent his voice to Tiggle and Walk It. It's dark, it's cold, and I'm on a wet dog. Hey, at least you're getting a free ride! Eric Stewart is the voice behind Rockney. Now here's the thing. 
Stewart's voice is by far the most notably altered in post. He gives Rockney this chilled out dude voice, but the voice is so obviously pitched up digitally it makes it both distracting and amusing to me. Clouds don't stay put for very long. Most of them fly away, some of them change shape, and others just float around looking for picnics to spoil. Bupkis is performed by Jerry Labazo. Some sources online report this as being Eric Stewart, and while I can hear some similarities, that's definitely Labazo. Labazo even put Tama and Friends on his resume as being a starring role, so that fits the bill for this bulldog seeing as he wouldn't fit with any other lead character. Tama, call me crazy, but I think them sounded like fighting words. So that's all of the main animal characters. But wait, we're missing one. What about Bengboo? Well, sources online list the role as being played by James Carter Cathcart, but this may not be the case. You see, this is cited from his profile when he attended Big Apple Anime Fest in 2003, listing Bengboo and Wocket. A contributor named 4Kids Identifier on Anime News Network lists this as a possible mistake, and that the person that wrote the page may have intended to put Tiggle and Wocket, both of which are played by Cathcart. If Cathcart did not voice Bengboo, then who did? Well, here's a clip for reference. Hey, hang on you two! Let's talk this out! Good friends like you shouldn't fight! Come on, time out! Now why are you fighting? As of now, no voice actor has responded to my inquiry on Bengboo's actor. Cathcart is unavailable for comment because as of this recording, he is battling throat cancer and has paused activity on social media. I and many others in the community wish him well during this time. I asked some people who they think voiced Bengboo. Someone I know that is a HUGE Pokemon anime fan says the clips sound like Cathcart, but that ANN listing sowed a seed of doubt in my mind. Let me know in the comments if you think this is Cathcart voicing Bengboo, and if you don't think it's his voice, let me know who you think it is. For now, I'll put up this voice actor profile with Cathcart, but put an asterisk as we've yet to 100% confirm this. Moving on to the humans, who do have confirmed voice actors, Dan Green is the actor for Casey. Green would make his big break in voice acting in a show debuting two weeks after Tama and Friends, voicing the lead character Yugi in Yu-Gi-Oh! Pretty cool looking, isn't it? I bet you're the first cat that's ever seen Saturn up close! Amy is performed by Veronica Taylor. Both then and now, Taylor's most famous voice acting credit is Ash Ketchum in the Pokemon anime back in the 4Kids era. In this anime, she is the love interest of a boy that happens to have Ash's original name. That's... kind of funny. Momo and I are on our way to the pet groomer at the mall and I thought I'd stop by to see if you and Tama wanted to join us. And one last role, Casey's faceless mom is voiced by Tara Sands. Oh Casey, I'd like you to go on a few errands for me please. Additional voices are provided by basically everyone on the cast, but as far as people that don't have main roles, Megan Hollingshead, Rachel Lillis, and Ted Lewis play some of the one-off characters in this dub. And the credits list three people as voice directors, Jason Bergenfeld, Jim Malone, and Anthony Salerno. Four kids seem to have big plans for Tama and Friends, as the official website listed a products page, extra content like Tama's World Adventure where he and his furry friends are put into real life pictures, and even a partnership with PetFinder.com to promote adopting cats and dogs and proper pet care. This is super cute and all, but regrettably for these animal pals, it's evident Tama and Friends wasn't the success 4Kids hoped it would be. While there are no official sources for its TV ratings, the official website stopped listing where to watch Tama on TV starting in late 2002, and the show was last known to have aired on TV on March 5th, 2005. The Tama and Friends merch page on this website never received any updates, even as late as August of 2007. Despite the lack of goods listed, Tama did receive American merch. Three soft keychains. Three soft keychains manufactured by a toy company named Basic Fun in 2002. And during recording, Blue Baron, someone that gave additional info seen in this video about this dub, sent me pictures of a birthday balloon by Qualitex. Qualitex's website lists a feel better balloon too, but no pictures are available. Thanks Blue Baron for sharing these findings. To date, the Tama and Friends English dub has had neither a home video nor streaming release, although a home video release was originally planned for the second quarter of 2003. Luckily for this cat, all 13 episodes that ran in syndication were recorded and uploaded online, meaning none of them are lost media. Granted, the recordings are not in the best of quality, as seen throughout the footage I've used in this episode. But here's where things get more interesting. According to multiple sources, Tama and Friends' dub has 26 episodes, not 13. 
The first source to look at is Roland Gonzalez, who listed the show on his LinkedIn under his time at 4Kids serving as a writer slash producer. The entry states he quote, wrote and developed entire 26 half hours of Tom and Friends animated series adaptation, unquote. Another source is a press release from MIPCOM discussing Tama going to international markets. The article states the program has, quote, 26 half-hour episodes, unquote, which tracks with Gonzalez's LinkedIn profile. One last source is Taj Productions' website. The thing is that this source lists 52 episodes, not 26, although this might be referring to 52 vignettes since the Japanese version only has 35 episodes. 52 may not be accurate, but is a number bigger than 13, implying there were more episodes than what made it to air. And here's something that further supports the claim of more dub episodes. This is a clip of a dub episode that never made it to TV found by Blue Baron. The clip was found on a website of a former 4Kids ADR engineer named Armin Muslumian. I bet you're hungry. Help yourself! But Wocket, this is supposed to be your dinner. That's okay. Besides, you're my guest. The same reel that held that clip also has clips of a dubbed OVA that was never released. In the OVA clips, Ted Lewis plays Tama, and voices like Eric Stewart and James Carter Cathcart can be heard voicing other characters. This dub is completely lost, and may not even exist in full. Who knows, maybe they just dubbed a few scenes and called it good. There are rumors the other 13 episodes aired in Canada, but that has not been confirmed. Heck, nobody is even sure if other countries' dubs that use 4Kids as masters aired all 26 episodes because a lot of those dubs are lost media too. So this part of Tama's English dub remains a mystery. Just like how the show is a vague memory for many kids of the era, actors and staff involved in Tom and Friends barely recall the show either. Michael Hagney, who is listed in the dub's credits as a voice producer, recently said on Twitter he doesn't recall much about Tama. Megan Hollings had answered Blue Baron on the stream when he asked about Tama and Friends. Give it a listen. Do you remember working on Tama and Friends? Wow! Did they dub the whole series? I cannot tell you. I did work on Tama and Friends. Wow, I just remember that it existed. I don't remember what I did. Blue Baron had previously contacted many people involved with this Tom and Friends dub both online and at conventions. Roland Gonzalez, Veronica Taylor, Dan Green, and Tara Sands all confirmed they don't remember anything about Tama either. Hey, post edit Yui here real quick. Roland Gonzalez did get back to me on Facebook and yeah, he doesn't remember much about Tama. It feels like the English dub of Tama and Friends is a collective dream people had in America 22 years ago and it somehow manifested itself into reality. Even watching the VHS recordings feels like having a dream, given how warped the picture and audio are in some episodes. One episode even has another show's audio cutting in and out, like the show is desperately fighting to override Tama. That little girl is trying to make you know, a lot of pain here, man. Mm -hmm. No. Especially when it can... Let me know in the comments if you can ID this show because I have no idea what it is. Whether Tom and Friends' dub was a dream or not doesn't matter, as it does exist and ultimately left the US with no real impact. So what happened? Why did Tom not go the distance and make 4Kids even more money? This is all speculation based on my analysis and experience, so take it with a grain of salt. Despite 4Kids boasting Tom and Friends having a multi-million dollar ad campaign, I can't recall seeing a single commercial for the show. Maybe that's just me since Central Ohio didn't have a primary WB affiliate since 2000. I guess there's some Ohio lore for you. WWHO switched to being a primary UPN affiliate, so we had Tama on Fox 28. But even then, I can only find one commercial for Tama online. To be honest, the one commercial out there doesn't make the show look all that appealing, just coming off as another regular kids show. Tama was also placed on the outskirts of Saturday morning kids blocks, while a lot of four kids as heavy hitters found their way onto those valuable time slots for both WB and Fox. It could be argued Tama and Friends would have been a hit if the show was part of those lineups, but I disagree. One, there's no guarantee it would have succeeded even with more attention, and two, it would have been the odd one out on any lineup. On that first point, Ultraman Tiga aired on Foxbox, a block that replaced Fox Kids in 2002, one year after Tom and Friends debuted in America. Ultraman Tiga underperformed on the station, leading to an early cancellation. If we go beyond series already mentioned, F-Zero GP Legend fell to the same fate, failing to reach high ratings and ultimately leaving the block before it even had the chance to air its finale. Whether or not that dub was finished and has unaired episodes is a topic for another day. 
To that second point, the vast majority of programming to ever air on 4Kids is Foxbox for action series aimed at the company's usual demo of boys from 7 to 13 or so. Even series that targeted a female demo like Winx Club and Mew Mew Power are still action series, whereas Tama is evidently for an even younger audience. Same deal for Kids WB in the early 2000s. A lot of series on the block were action focused, and the ones that weren't action series were shows that would clash with Tama and Friends' mood and pace. No matter where he would potentially end up, Tama and his friends would be overshadowed by bigger shows. Just for the sake of argument though, let's explore that possibility mentioned earlier. What if Tama was on one of those blocks? Could he have succeeded amidst action shows coupled with more advertising and merch? That's such an odd set of circumstances and it's not like we have any other cases like this in American broadcast history. Except we do. Everyone, meet Hamtaro. Some of you may already know him, or at least recognize him from somewhere. If you're not familiar with Hamtaro, it's like Tama and Friends, but it has hamsters instead of cats and dogs. We'll go over Hamtaro in depth another time, so consider this section an extra treat for your figurative Halloween candy bag. The series' 2000 anime made its North American debut nine months after Tama and Friends, first showing up on cable TV on June 3rd, 2002. So where am I going with this? Hamtaro faced a comparable situation to Tama and Friends when it came over to North America. In fact, the TV show found itself in an even better spot than the hypothetical situation that may have led to Tama and Friends' success. Hamtaro's English dub aired at 7am on Cartoon Network and 4pm on Toonami, Cartoon Network's action block that is mostly made up of anime but has had a few American works in there as well. Once upon a time, Toonami aired weekday afternoons on the station before being only on during Saturday nights, so Hamtaro was on Monday through Friday two times a day. To say Hamtaro was the odd one out on the Toonami lineup would be an understatement, as it aired alongside popular action shows like Dragon Ball Z and Batman Beyond. In Canada, the show launched in August 2002 on YTV, airing Sunday to Friday at 8.30am and 1.30pm, giving Hamtaro a strong presence even in America's neighbor to the north. That makes sense, seeing as the dub was produced in Canada. Hamtaro had way more advertising and merchandise in North America than Tama ever did, including toys by Hasbro and books by Scholastic. The hamster even had some of his video games localized for the Western market. Did this new hamster on the block become a ratings hit despite its early morning time slot and mismatched genre and tsunami? Shockingly, yes. According to an article published by ICV2 that July, Hamtaro's cute hamster adventures were a rating success with boys from 9 to 14 in both its 7am and 4pm broadcasts. Licensor Viz reported a similar phenomenon from Anime Expo that year, saying they had a quote, older, more male crowd than expected, unquote. I mean, heck, Sean Akins, who served as creative director of Toonami at the time Hamtaro joined the channel, said he and many other, quote, really callous action guys, unquote, on the Toonami team liked Hamtaro too. Thing was, though, the Toonami crew was forced to air Hamtaro on their block by higher-ups, much to the annoyance of regular viewers. Even with grievances from the Toonami faithful, these initial numbers led to speculation the little hamster with big adventures could be the next mega-hit from Japan that Cartoon Network was hoping for. However, Hamtaro quickly got the boot from Toonami's afternoon run. The anime stayed on the block for four months before being replaced, ending its run at 52 episodes. Hamtaro did continue to air on Cartoon Network, though, and received 53 more episodes in 2003, switching around time slots throughout its run. Despite initial hopes, Hamtaro fever never caught on, and the show continued in reruns on the channel until October 30th, 2004. Even though it aired for less time than Tama and Friends, Hamtaro is remembered by far more people. With a better advertising campaign and more retail presence, Hamtaro was poised to succeed, but ultimately was a passing fad. Still, it developed die-hard Ham Ham fanatics during its stay in the US. Let's circle this back to Tama and Friends. Could Tama and Friends have succeeded with a better time slot, more marketing, and more merchandise? Probably not. Remember, Hamtaro had more episodes and merch, even a freaking Burger King toy line. And it still didn't even come close to rivaling the likes of Pokemon in America. If Tama and Friends got the treatment Hamtaro did, the only thing it would do is make the show better remembered by more people and maybe preserved with better quality on VHS recordings. Tama and Friends sadly didn't have a cat in hell's chance to succeed in North America. But all this Tama success talk is speculation and has gone up for a bit now. So let me know in the comments if you agree, disagree, or have more to add to my points. The 90s outing with Tama was not destined to be completely forgotten, as in 2020, Aniplex of America licensed the anime and uploaded it to Crunchyroll and Retro Crush with English subtitles. The English dub is out there online, but be warned, the recordings aren't in the best quality, so to those out there that suffer from epileptic seizures, there are flashing lights from the low quality footage. And 
Yeah, 2020's Tom and Friends version of Equestria Girls is also available subtitle on Crunchyroll. There has not been any major new material since then for this wholesome cat, but he did have this random cameo in the latest City Hunter film of all things. Will the English dub ever be officially available, be it streaming or home video? Will we ever find the rest of the 4Kids dub and even that OVA? Will Tama return to the States with a ferocious meow? Only time will tell. But until then, Tama and Friends serves as an odd, interesting piece of 4Kids Entertainment's history. Stay tuned as I will be announcing the next episode soon. Thank you to everyone that expressed excitement for Tama and Friends. I had no idea so many viewers would be excited to see this series be covered in English dub history. I was just spitballing ideas on what to do for October since my original plans couldn't be done in time and somehow my supporters and I landed on Tama. I think I was just scrolling through my list of requests and saw Tama listed and I'm like, why not? Is anyone going to be that excited about Tama and how complicated could it possibly be? Boy was I wrong on both those things. It was fun though, especially because I started work on this episode in early September only to have to completely overhaul it late in development with new info thanks to Blue Baron. I'm taking a break on main English dub history episodes until December since next month is Thanksgiving in the US. I'm taking time to see family and do a few other things, but I'll be back in December for a special holiday episode and one more episode after that before we end 2023. You'll need to wait until around Christmas for them to come out. I've been working on the next episode on and off since February. I'm so excited to finally announce it. Next month, I may put out a small bonus video like some of my favorite things in my media collection. We'll see. I know some people have asked about that. Shout out to all of my supporters on Patreon and Twitch. Supporters on either platform got to see this video early, so if you'd like to support what I do, gain access to my exclusive Discord server, and have your name on screen here, please consider supporting. Until next time, take care.